virtually every man it seems has a price because it is every man for himself in a society of grief. The frills of the society indicate progress, but the fundamentals do not. Politics reigns supreme with self-interest at the core. Youth are polarizing, entrenching the worst and intensifying the best. Women are Jamaica's stars. Their future is Jamaica's future. All things have changed, but not always for the better. With these experiences absorbed, I can see clearly the reason for a no-growth, low-growth, stagnant economy. The economic gains were never given a chance to be consolidated and accumulated. They were wiped away, sometimes for ideological reasons, at other times by the intense desire to deny paternity for progress to others or to claim innovation for self. This is our political culture. Twice the economy reached robust levels in the late 1960s and 1980s, and twice it was ambushed by reckless policies or a misunderstanding of how the economic system should work. Most damaging of all was the failure to maintain a policy of a pegged exchange rate, adopted in all the more successful economies of the region, preferring to follow the way of the few who were riding the slippery slope of an erratic plunging exchange rate. This helped to create a prolonged, stagnant, failing Jamaican economy, unknown anywhere else in the English-speaking countries of the region, or indeed, as now revealed at the World Economic Forum in January, by any other country in the world. And yet, there is no regret. Meanwhile, regional and global schemes that would fail any cost-benefit test of protection of Jamaica's interests are gullibly swallowed and are still being forcefully promoted. Even if the body is now independent, the mind, it seems, is not. Every misconceived change is a start over in which the loser is the Jamaican economy with new and bigger sacrifices to try to catch up. On this basis, it will never return to the days of greater glory. There is too much politics in politics. If there was less politics, politics would be able to do what politics should do, develop Jamaica. The problem is in the means to the end. The solution is in pulling up, not pulling down, nor indeed pulling apart. Pulling apart the layers of racialism was not a matter of peeling and unwrapping layer by layer. The layers are interdigitated with antisocial rejections. Separating the layers is a complex, delicate process. Inevitably, this would uncover the social embitterment of disrespect that aggravates the complex problems of the social order. Pulling up avoids this disintegration. The process of pulling up to earn more is best driven by systems to learn more. All societies thrive on educational training to create a productive labor force to promote growth. A society with a failed education system cannot generate products of merit with a claim to economic value social respect or national pride. There is no educated country that is poor, and no poor country that is educated. That is the key. In a dysfunctional education a system in which more than 70% of graduates fail to matriculate, frustration and anger are the outcomes if the oppressive social system cannot be pulled down and the education system cannot be pulled out. If the economy is shackled by limited opportunities for producing legitimate wealth and the disrespected masses have ladders that are too short to scale the walls of deprivation, then the inevitable recourse is the illegal routes of illegitimate pursuits, crime and drugs. Check the corners in the inner city community and the shop steps in rural areas and the worthless boys and careless girls will be found because we put them there. 
Sloganeering education is not the solution. It is merely an expression of a device to talk the talk without walking the walk. Educational reforms must begin where education begins, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Far more disillusioned young people are being produced annually, three out of every four by a malfunctioning education system that a limited means of economic betterment can absorb. While many fit into the manpower needs uncomfortably, one way or the other, a good many are misfits, ready for solutions that are the easy way out. At the root of all this is the self-serving interpretation of respect and justice. I quote from the Folk Roots of Cultural Identity, my inaugural address at the University of the West Indies on May, in May 2005. A sense of justice is fundamental to the traditional Jamaican psyche. There is good reason for this. Respect and justice go hand in hand. Justice is an unrequited need. Respect is a badge of honor. Is injustice, is disadvantage, is disrespect a familiar prize. There is a sense of natural law defining in Jamaica which demands that respect you always. This natural jaw, law of justice incorporates a legal basis, but also involves a wider concept of social justice, which itself includes all manner of wrongs, bad roads, lack of water, poor schools, and not caring medical attention, are as much an injustice as an act of terror because it is an offense against those who have neither wealth nor privilege to protect themselves. Through the eyes of the underprivileged, the concept of injustice does not fully include the plight of the, plight of the rich and powerful. It is fed that they must fend for themselves. In an underprivileged Jamaica, we are crossing over to a better life is an obstacle course of shackles. Injustice is anything that makes life harder while so many enjoy. This sets the tone for the wide gap between the two Jamaicans. While justice is a pillar of stability, respect is the true dynamic that drives the need to succeed to be somebody. Jamaican women man half of the households of Jamaica. The burden of domestic pressures, amazingly, does not prevent many women from pursuing careers which often require further training or study. The core determination to achieve is part of the assertive coping strategies of the challenging and competitive upbringing which many women symbols of achievement in Jamaica. Women are bastions of the church, the backbone of political support determined players in civil organizations, achievers in scholarship, and a source of great reliance at any workplace. As such, they are more than women. As mothers, they are a resource base of exceptional strength. These strengths tame the flow of consequential disasters of an inconsequential economy, a malfunctioning educational system, and a turbulent cultural milieu. They buy time to repair the breach. As one who fought from the inception of my career in public service for the betterment of Jamaica and for a birth of a Jamaican nation to foster stability, create prosperity, and induce harmony, allaying the anxiety of the rich and quenching the anger of the poor are not moved by the evidence that in the colonial period much of this hardship did not exist. Independence did not bring such hardships to our regional sister states. Independence has not failed Jamaica. It is Jamaica which has failed independence. And it is Jamaicans who must reset the course to return it to its auspicious star, a generational change 
is needed to return the spirit of earlier pioneering years to start again to map a new course to avoid prolonged distress. After 50 years, Jamaica is today facing a future without a credible vision. It is well that much of the achievement of the post-independence period, although there are few, still have life to continue to contribute to nation building. But this perspective is mostly short term. The musical heritage, reggae, which propelled us to center stage in the cultural world, having made an indelible imprint, just stated by young people rich in creativity, is one of the stunning successes of the past 50 years. But with signs of frailty emerging, the question must be asked, how much longer can the impetus of this music endure without reinventing itself? The wealth of talent in sports, particularly track and field, allowed us to stun the world with a triumphant display of Jamaican athletic prowess at the Olympic and World Games, which must rank as one of the greatest achievements of the post-independence period. Indeed, indeed, one of the great achievements of Olympic history. Long may this prize of Jamaica live to continue to bring us future glory, but sports in general is a fickle area sustained by public popularity. The world of industry and services has witnessed remarkable Jamaican achievements with matter, with and without foreign partners, in the development of a world-class tourism industry, which has reliably become one of the cornerstones of the Jamaican economy. So too has there been, again, starting from scratch, a grand industrial development of a bauxite alumina industry but the resource base of both of these landmark developments have limitations of exploitable new areas for expansion. These major achievements of the post-independence period are buttressed by remittance flows from families abroad for other purposes. The spectacular increases in remittance flows since 1990 moved it to the top position in the Jamaican economy for foreign exchange inflows, but it too has some limitations which are beyond domestic control. Based on the background of these achievers, which together still fall far short of closing the foreign exchange gap, what other untapped resource base exists to be exploited on a large scale? The nation has to see is dreaming and become visionaries of a future that can push the economy and its workforce to new and greater heights. For more than two decades, I have repeatedly voiced the mantra that situated as we are, virtually on the coastline of the world's richest economy, Jamaica has no reason to be poor. All proximity to this great marketplace creates a center of preference for Jamaica to exploit in developing or finishing products from the Far East, China and India, South America, Brazil, and even Europe, utilizing negotiated tax relief benefits of the Caribbean-based initiative for export duty-free entry to the U.S. market. For years I've been promoting this idea based on reclaiming land in Kingston Harbor for Fort Augusta, at Fort Augusta. The proposal, whether at Fort Augusta or Caymanas, makes sense in the same way that the development of a massive garment industry complex was established in the 1980s for exporting goods manufactured by Hong Kong firms and creating over 40,000 new jobs. It became a huge foreign exchange earner for the economy. Beyond this, the Jamaican government must put aside the timidity and embrace the policy of the pegged exchange rate, which would reduce inflation to minimal levels, 
Lower the still high interest on commercial loan rates of financial institutions to business friendly level. Reduce expenditure in the cost of servicing external debt and making payments on interest, profit and dividends earned by overseas investment. And indeed, reduce the stock of debt. Open the door for potential massive inflows of low interest foreign exchange for mortgage financing and investment since the risk of devaluation or depreciation of the rate of exchange would no longer exist. This would be a revolutionary way of attracting low-cost funds for agriculture, education, infrastructure, and low-cost housing, creating thousands of new jobs. Most of all, it would restore the economic growth which has been stagnant for two decades because the increased prices which follow devaluations will cease, ensuring that none of the substance of growth of the economy would be extracted from the GDP to pay the higher prices of devaluation. The enormous potential which exists from this proposal, if properly investigated, contracted, and executed, result in huge investments and jobs sufficient to make a dramatic impact on the needs of the struggling economy. This is a future that could change the vision of the economy, from hopelessness to hopefulness, as experienced in the earlier generational periods of post-independent Jamaica. It could greatly assist in winning the race between development and discontent, and ensure that as we look to the future, we will never again grasp defeat from the jaws of victory. Based on current perceptions, many feel that the Jamaican flag should be blown upside down as the accepted international signal of distress. But the design of this flag is unusual. It is the same pattern whether it is flown upside down or downside up. Maybe this is meant to convey that there will be no need to signal any lasting distress in Jamaica if new visions replace age-old failures with a new perspective of the future. I thank the members of the honourable.